Hi everyone, thanks for coming out tonight. I'm Rachel Shepard. I'm Bailey Reed. And I'm Will Slack. In this semester, we've had a great time working with Southwest Airlines. Our client has been the Director of Revenue Management, Mary Warden, and unfortunately she was not able to make it tonight. So, our overview for tonight, we want to tell you a bit about our project, um, our approach, then what we did with the data and how we handled it in models, results and recommendations, future recommendations, and to see if you guys have any questions. So a little bit about our project. We worked with revenue management and we were trying to optimize the Southwest network to determine the revenue maximizing mix of direct destinations and corresponding number of flights. So a little history on this. I don't know if you guys have heard about the right amendment, but back, um, so a year ago, the right amendment was repelled in October 2014, and the right amendment was a federal law in 1979 that restricted flights going direct, um, only direct flights from within Texas and the bordering states. And so um, in October 2014, it was repelled, but um, we're looking back, the data is October 2013 to October 2014, so we can make suggestions to where they would fly direct. Okay, so moving into kind of the first step of the process, and this is really the data analysis and data mining component. So we know that, as Rachel mentioned, demand and revenue are kind of our two main areas of focus. So first we'll look at demand, and we know this is a critical input as it's really going to determine how Southwest and their management will then structure their entire route network, and including how many planes and what plane sizes will go to certain cities and times there. So first for demand, we wanted to give you a little bit of background we sat down with Mary Warden, who was our contact at Southwest, and we developed what we call the demand equation. So all in all, it equals total demand equals current demand plus captured market share and then net new demand. We felt that this would be best illustrated by looking at kind of a pie chart. So first and foremost, current demand is fairly intuitive. It's just looking at how much market share Southwest has within a current market. So for instance, the yellow slice of this pie on the right-hand side from, let's say, Dallas to Albuquerque. Then we look at our captured market share this would look at how much market share could Southwest potentially take from a competitor. So in this instance, how much could they take away from American that could then be added to Southwest demand. Finally, we have our net new demand, which represents our overall kind of market growth. So if Southwest enters a brand new market or adds more flights, can we expect some organic growth within that? Our sources for the demand uh, mostly were the Southwest internal data set that we received, and then Mary Wharton, our contact, also gave us access to the DOME data set that includes FAA and other federal government required mandated data in terms of demand and traffic. Further diving into demand, we found that we would require some segmentation in terms of how we would go about calculating it. So first, our first piece of segmentation was Dallas as the origin. So looking at Dallas um, originating passengers, then traveling to destinations that are currently served for the direct flight, as well as destinations like Atlanta that would require a connection Within our second iteration, it includes the first iteration of Dallas as the origin, but then also takes into account demand for Dallas as a connecting point. So for instance, let's say I'm starting as a passenger in Austin, I connect to Dallas Love Field, and then I go to Albuquerque. That has to be included in the demand component as um, the Southwest network is less of a hub and spoke model like most airlines, it's more of a connecting point to flight. Finally, we wanted to see what is the demand for Dallas as a destination. So all of the destinations that Southwest serves then flowing in to Dallas Love Field. So we also wanted to give you a bit of an illustration of what the debt demand calculation looks like. It's a bit of an onerous process, but we thought we'd give you just a snapshot. In particular, we look at ATL Atlanta, which is in the red box. So starting from the far left side, we see um, Southwest Airlines, or SWA, current demand. This is the demand numbers that we were able to parse out from their current internal data set. Then we move into captured market share, which was a little bit more complex to pull out we have to do a dynamic search pool from the DOME data set, and then from there we built out a sensitivity analysis to see, given a certain percentage of market capture, how many passengers would require or demand this route, and then also we do a mental calculation of, okay, does this make sense to see how many passengers would this translate to flight numbers? So if we have X amount of passengers, this would equal Y number of flights. Does this make sense? The next column just sums those two, and then finally we look at our overall market growth. So this was the market pie expansion that we talked about. Our growth rate that we chose was 3%, and we determined this from historical precedents. So for instance, we would go back and see how did the Denver market grow when Southwest aired as an airline, or how did the Portland market grow when Southwest started offering service there. 
From there, we were able to sum our total demand, and then that could be converted into the model. Now I'll turn over to Rachel to do some revenue calculations. So for the model, we needed revenue per flight, like per route, Dallas to Albany, or Dallas to Albany as the origin and destination flight. OND stands for origin and destination. However, um, we didn't get the data for revenue per flight, so we calculated it, summing total revenue that Dallas to Albany made for the year, and then summing total booked, like total booked seats, and dividing the revenue per booked seat. And you can see in this column, it actually comes out about to be the price of one way ticket for each of these routes. So that was a good indicator that we were on the right track. <coughs> and then to get the revenue per flight, we multiplied this by 125, and this was at, um, this is like, if the plane was at 85% cap capacity, this is how much revenue this flight would make. And we use the 125 number because there are different seat capacities on the Southwest, Southwest um, flight network, and there's 680 planes with um, 143 seats, and then there are 100 737s with 175 seats, so we used a weighted average of an ideal like hybrid plane of 147 seats. And now to Bailey to talk about the model. So as you can see, we did a lot of uh, front-end work to really get the model to be successful in the form of revenue and demand calculations. Um, here are a couple of assumptions we made uh, before really diving into the modeling portion. So we decided that uh, co-terminals could be treated as one destination or um, point. This is not just us, the FFA also, FAA also does this. Um, also, we could make recommendations about exiting a market. So if there's an existing flight that Southwest has that's not that great, we could tell them that they might want to get rid of it. Also, we did not have to take into account flight times. So we could just say there's this many flights per day and not really worry about the scheduling aspect. Also, uh, we could fly anywhere we wanted, no gas, no distance concerns. Um, also, a very key assumption we made is that the revenue generated by um, flights are uh, reciprocal, oh, not reciprocal, uh, mirrored. So uh, outbound flights and inbound flights make generally the same amount of revenue. So next, uh, here are a couple constraints we uh, were kind of given by Mary uh, when looking at our model. Uh, first of all, she wanted us to look at uh, the existing flights and keeping that number within three either direction. Um, so if you have 25 flights to Houston, don't drop it below or above three either way. Um, also, if we recommended a flight, she wanted to cap the number of flights per day at six, so we couldn't add more than six flights per day on a new direct flight. Also, the load factor for the new flights had to be 85%. The load factor just means of the available seats, 85% of them have to be full. Um, also, we cannot exceed 160 arrivals or departure in a single day. Um, so each of them gets 160. Uh, finally, the destinations that, uh, as, that Southwest doesn't currently uh, serve, we didn't have to take into account. So on to the fun part, the models. Uh, so we decided to take a two-model approach. Um, we felt it was better to start with a smaller, uh, more condensed model and then kind of build out from there. So the first model we made only looked at the direct arrivals and departures for new and existing markets. So that would be like Dallas to Albuquerque or Houston to Dallas. So we didn't have the O&D component. Um, and that way we could run some initial runs and tests on it. And if we were getting similar numbers, we kind of knew we were going in the right direction. It was kind of a checking point. Um, so the second model uh, is the first model plus O&D, which is that origin and destination we talked about with the stopover. And this really gave us a more realistic idea of what the revenue was going to look like. Uh, basically what our model did was it had um, variables that were all the different flight options, and it said how many flights per day that flight route should have. Uh, so here are our results. Um, we kind of did a smattering of different uh, runs on the model with different levels of constraints and bounds, really to give a holistic overview of the different options Southwest had available to them. So in red are the Model 1 runs. You'll see that we did fewer of them. Again, it was more of a trial and less of a realistic model. Um, and with those, uh, pre-write and post-write means uh, we took those, if, if it's pre-write, we took the pre-write values from October 2014, uh, the number of flights per day they were flying to those destinations, and we set 
the number of flights per day, those uh, variables equal to that. That way we could see how the new flights would react. Um, if not, then we just kind of let it run wild and see what happened. <laughs> Um, also with the bounds, you'll see the plus or minus three flights per day. That's initially what Mary wanted. But then we also looked at bounds from zero to uh, over three flights. And this kind of gave us a broader range to play with. And it also um, allowed us to eliminate flights that were existing in the Southwest network that were um, underproducing. So as you can see from this, there's a number of runs, but uh, the most successful was the, oh, also, sorry, the arrivals and departure numbers, you'll see a little variation in that because Southwest has the ability to add up to two gates, potentially, if they so choose. So the highest performer was $5.8 million per day in revenue, and that's number nine on M2, and that's uh, without the pre-write constraints, so the, uh, constraint, the uh, variables weren't set at that value, and uh, they had 180 arrivals and departures to fill out, and obviously with more capacity, you can do a lot more with revenue. Um, but without any changes, uh, you'll see that the best one we had was number six on model two, which is the post right at uh, 5.3 million. And that's not changing any of the uh, existing gate numbers or things like that. So that's something Southwest could realistically implement. Um, it's not that interesting to note that it's the one with the widest bounds. Uh, this was the one that could eliminate existing flights and reattribute those to uh, new flights that might be higher or better performers. So we found uh, these results to be pretty interesting. And also, uh, currently, Southwest is making $4.4 million per day in revenue. So we had a nice improvement that was realistic, but also nice for them. So then after that, we want to see a lot of our numbers and evaluate which cities are we looking at. And one thing that we were encouraged about with the was the consistency of our model and that across all the models and across all the iterations, almost all of them we can spit out the same mix of cities. So they're listed in front of you, but just to name some of my favorite destinations, I'd say New York, uh, Washington, and San Francisco were all very consistent, in addition to some other ones as well, some popular destinations that I'm sure all of you would like to go to. Finally, as a team, we decided to sit down and consider if we had more time or if we wanted to pass on this project to a future senior design group, what would we change and what would we reconsider? First and foremost, we'd say that we would re-examine the model through a system-wide lens, given the OND traffic. So on your average Southwest Airlines flight, about 60% of passengers will terminate or end in a destination, as in they'll exit, go through security, take their bags, and then that is their final destination. Whereas 40%, given the nature of Southwest network, will actually connect and then go on to a further destination. So it would be nice to have a more system-wide perspective. Additionally, we'd also like to calculate revenue on a per-passenger basis rather than a per-flight. Yes, we do have the um, load factor capacity constraints, but there are still going to be some variations over that, whether it's we remove that, it's passengers below the number or above. And then finally, we want to ensure that all new flights that are added have both an arrival and a departure correspondent, because the way that our model did spit some numbers back, it would add a departure to San Francisco, but maybe not an equal return, or they would be equal returns. And with that, we'd like to open up the floor to questions. Questions? So, um, I want to I wrote it down. Yes. See what I wrote. Put in the glasses. Uh, well, this thing on um, percent mark, market capture, some of this front end work that you had to do. So, how sensitive are your final results to your front end pre work? I would say. They would have a direct, we could do a better job of testing kind of the correlation there. We did produce a spreadsheet for Southwest that they can easily input or change numbers and then it would automatically flow through, then be put in comma separated value to put in the model. Um, we didn't specifically go through and do an analysis there, but given that demand and revenue are critical factors, it would most likely have a direct correlation or a direct impact. And I will say on the modeling side, uh, that 85% load factor pulls directly from demand. And uh, that value, we ran it at a couple different levels, even though we were assuming an 85% uh, level. And it really, it was not that much in either direction, uh, changing that load factor. I remember you said that there were a few different things you didn't include, like gas and I forget what the other ones were. Do you think this would have changed your final results? 
mean, with security and baggage claims and gas and layovers, I mean, there's so many little things throughout mm -hmm. uh, the aeronautics system that it would have definitely been a more complex model. And mm -hmm. of course, with that, there'd be a bunch of changes. I don't know how they would have affected it. Uh, yeah, and gas falls on the cost side of it. So keeping in mind, this was just from a revenue standpoint. Yeah. And I think one of the biggest constraints we didn't um, include in this model was actually um, baggage carousels. It's a big problem with airports. So if you had too many flights, then you're... Yeah, the baggage carousels could only handle so many flights per Same hour. The ground crews. And obviously that'll reduce revenue because it will reduce flight numbers. So did, did you recommend any cities they, that they're not going direct to yet? Yes, there yeah, were two that stood out. Uh, Charlotte and then Minneapolis were two that were going to spout out by the model, and we spoke with Mary about those. Those are interesting because those are both strongholds for Minneapolis for Delta and then Charlotte for American Airlines. And there is sufficient demand there, but given that we are maximizing revenue and that's what's most important for this department specifically, those are very high revenue generating cities. So the, I think that Southwest decision not to fly those markets was more strategic on their part rather than a purely, if you're looking at it from a pure lens of revenue and demand, it does make sense to fly these markets. Yes. You know, and they fly to all these now, but just not direct out of Dallas, right? Yeah, yes. we couldn't add any um, airport that they don't currently fly to, and we considered all airports that they do currently fly to. Except international, because Dallas Left Field can't do the customs and immigration laws. So, what were some of the unfavorable ones? Just curious. Some of the what? Some of the unfavorable? Uh, of Milwaukee. <laughs> Milwaukee yeah. was not a high performer. Those models, I think, said they wanted to drop <clears throat> Oklahoma City and Birmingham entirely. What? Yes. Which yeah. repeatedly. Yeah. Never repeat. So. Bad news if you're from either Birmingham or Oklahoma City. Home Alabama, not something. The one that my wife and I would like to know about is when we're going to go to Hawaii. <laughs> we actually asked her about that. One. So that that's actually an interesting one because it's kind of a um, one-dimensional direction in terms of travels. That many islanders do not really from the mainland, but there are so many people who want to come out to Hawaii to vacation. The 737 is capable of flying that distance now. Maybe not from Dallas, but. I, I, based on Mary's comments, it doesn't look like that's the procedure. The plane uh, usage sorry. also takes up the flight there, takes up basically the whole plane. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much.